the TCT Network brings you Rejoice. A connection of encouragement to build your faith and lift you to a new experience in God. Our program is specifically designed to bring you hope and the healing power of God through His Word and prayer. Now, here's today's Rejoice, hosted by Tom Nolan. Hello, it's good to be joining you from Greensboro, North Carolina again. We've been having a great time here, and if you stay tuned, you're going to have a great time as well. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to remind you about that number at the bottom of your screen. 1-800-232-9855 is your number for prayer. And if you have anything you want to pray about today, just call that number and one of our prayer partners will take your call and pray for you, whatever it may be. But I'm joined today by uh, Ben Kinchlow great uh, television host and founder of Americans for Israel. Great to have you back with us today. Thank you, thank you. Shalom Aleichem. Well, shalom uh, to you. I can't do it all. But. <laughs> he, he can't either. <laughs> <laughs> it will work in Israel. <laughs> and, and Earl Cox back with us, uh, the ambassador to the Christian world from Israel and uh, has served for uh, four U.S. presidents, um, been involved in <coughs> broadcasting, many different things, but always good to have uh, you with us here helping us to promote Israel and uh, sharing with us about what's going on over there. It's always a pleasure to be with anybody that takes and do what you people do, and that is try to educate people on why we need to stand with the state of Israel. Well, and our other guest is uh, back with us. I'm glad that you could come back and uh, continue to share because uh, it was such a good program when you were on with us before. And uh, I know there was more that we just ran out of time, didn't get to ask, but Stuart Kaufman, uh, retired lawyer, businessman, entrepreneur, uh, so many uh, different things that you've done. But uh, you were sharing with us last program about how uh, you were kind of influential and very involved in the ground zero mosque that was going to be built right by uh, where Muslims attacked the U.S. Opposition to the ground. I, I will get to that. <laughs> I, I don't want to misrepresent you. But you were very influential in that whole situation, actually stopping that from going into place. Well, I, I, I certainly don't want to lay claim to uh, having accomplished that feat. Uh, I, I had a part in it, and I'm privileged to have done so. Uh, the thing about that, uh, that place was that it was uh, identified as a place where the, uh, the, the Muslims wanted to use it as a, uh, an Islamic center. That was their claim. They wanted to build a 15-story building with a mosque in it and a meeting place, ostensibly to have as a gathering place and a place of understanding for all the, the, the New Yorkers and other people, et cetera, et cetera. And it was really simply a way of demonstrating their continuing uh, effort to, uh, to show that Allah has, uh, has uh, uh, vanquished all uh, opposition. Uh, you know, when you were on the program last time, you talked about specific, you might want to refresh our memories on that, because when they take over a place, you know, like that, it has a real specific significance to them. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's triumphalist. Uh, they placed their holy places on the land, the places that are holy to others, in order to demonstrate that they have triumphed, which is why the Al-Aqsa Mosque is located on the Temple Mount, why the Hagia Sophia huge mosque in Istanbul is located in the former Santa Sophia Church, which was the largest Basilica in Christendom, uh, and this this is the way they operate. They try to establish their hegemony hegemony over the places that are holy to others. So and they're not just moving into the neighborhood like neighbors. Not at all. Not at all. This is a demonstration of their triumph. Tell, tell, tell us why did after the war that uh, the the Israeli government gave the Temple Mount to the Arabs. Why was that? It doesn't make sense. Well, um, there are a lot of background stories and explanations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the simplest... Mo Moshe Dayan, right? Moshe Dayan is the, the one the who actively did it. There are those who say that Dayan wasn't the one who was behind it, but it was Moshe Dayan who did it. Uh, and it was unnecessary. 
It was unnecessary. As a matter of fact, there's a book that came out that says that there were explosives that were laying all around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, prepared to demolish it. And Diane uh, uh, prevented it. And then Diane arranged, just said, that the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. the, the surface area that, uh, that held the Temple, uh, Solomon's Temple and then the Temple that was rebuilt by Herod, uh, that the Temple Mount was given to something that's called the Waqf. Right. Uh, the Waqf is controlled by the Jordanian government, and the Waqf has exclusive jurisdiction over the Temple Mount. And Jews can't go up there now. Well, Jews go up there only under very restricted circumstances, but no Jew and no Gentile, no Christian, is permitted to pray, pray no. on the Temple Mount. But the only Muslims. The government, is, correct me if I'm wrong, the government of Israel has said, no, no Jews can go up there now. Well, they restrict it, right. and if any Jew goes up there, they're, they're, they are permitted on very certain, very limited times. If they are seen praying right. or mouthing or looking as if, then the Israeli police come and take them away. And this is on Israeli ground. This is Israeli ground. Correct. And the Jordanian government has control of it up there, Tom. It's, it's amazing. Well, not only that, it's even more egregious than that, because what's happened is <clears throat> the uh, Waqf uh, has now, they decided they're going to put another mosque on what? the Temple Mount. Yes. And what they're doing it is they're, they're pulling it in what's called the Solomon's... Um, stables. So, yes, yeah, Solomon's stables. In other words, there's an area beneath... Uh, the, right. the, this, anyway, they have excavated that, and what they've done, I mean, just think about it. There have been no archaeological digs on the Temple Mount. Now, part of the reason is because of significant opposition by religious Jewish authorities, because since we don't know where the Holy of Holies was located, they don't want to make and a since and dig you into can't that. step right. foot on it, right. it's sacred ground. Anyway, the, the Muslims have dug out a substantial part of what's called Solomon's Stables, and there has been no, you understand, when, when you're doing uh, archaeological uh, excavations, every single piece of dirt is gridded and drawn, and you know where every artifact is. Well, what they do is they just dig it out, and they throw it over the wall. And then what's happened since, I think it's been 2006, what the Israelis have done is they are sifting every single piece of dirt. And the discoveries have been Amazing, but the problem is that there are archaeological difficulties because they are no longer in situ. They don't know where they were located. Right. So this is another attempt by the Waqf, by the Muslims, mm -hmm. to destroy the holy place of the Jews. Well, how do they get permission to go up there and dig? I mean, you just can't go set up a building. If I want to go just build something in Israel, I had to get permission from the Israeli government, right? Uh, unless you're a Muslim, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the fact is that, I mean, I hesitate. My, Mel Brooks has a very shorthand way of explaining why we Jews do things. He says, Jews are nuts. <laughs> and and, and the, fact Mel is, the, the, the fact is that the Israeli government does things in large measure, I think, to appease Absolutely. world opinion. That's correct. Un... Uh, without recognizing the fact that whatever Israel does is going to be frowned on, is going to be condemned. So as my attitude is, this belongs to Israel. Get them off. And that includes Judea and Samaria. Talk to us about that for just Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria, well, it's identified as the West Bank or, or even worse, the occupied territories. Occupied by whom? It was occupied by the Arabs until the Israelis took it back. In war. In war. The fact is... He figured, when, though, the key word you use is back. Yes. Took it back. Correct. Not took it from. Exactly. But Judea and Samaria is the place where 80% of the events in the Hebrew Bible took place. And I don't know the percentage, but a significant number of the events in the New Testament as well. Now, there are places in Judea and Samaria that you've probably never heard of that you can go and visit. Now, I, I'm not going to mention the, the, the usual places like Beit El, which is where uh, uh, Jacob laid his head down and where he wrestled with the angel. Right. 
I'm not going to re mention Beth Ale. You mean Bethel? Well, it's Beth Ale. Beth Ale. Yeah. Okay, just Beth make sure. So, as, as Christian, Jacob would have known Hebrew. that. Uh, be careful. Jacob Hebrew. would have known it as Beth Ale. He wouldn't have yes. recognized Bethel, <laughs> or uh, or Shiloh, 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 which was a pace, the location of the of the tabernacle. I'm not going to even talk about those places, which you can go visit. But there's a place in Israel, in Samaria, called Azekah. A-Z-E-K-A. I know Earl knows about it. Do you, have you ever heard of Azekah? No. Azekah is the place where David slew Goliath. Get out. Yeah. No. Yeah. And if you go there today, you'll see the little right. brook that goes right through the valley. On this side of the valley is where the, the Hebrews were camped, and on this side of the valley is where the Philistines were. Get out and of here. if you climb the, the hill where the Philistines were, you'll see a big pile of clay shards. And you can take one from the pile and take it home with you. And those are Philistines. That, that is the place where David slew Goliath. You can walk in that valley. You can walk by the river. And you can pick up five smooth stones. Right. That is part of Samaria. Good and, for, and, 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 and for anybody to say that it's occupied territory, that it is not part of the, of the very heart and soul of the state of Israel, is to me calumny. Well, why don't we know this? I mean, I'm... I mean, I bet you 90% of the people like me, that's the first time they've ever heard of this. Real doesn't do a very good job in public relations. We do a lot of good things, Jews. We, we invent great plastic glasses, but we, we, don't, we don't do very, a good job of convincing people of, of the legitimacy of, of, of what we say. They're absolutely the worst. I've talked to government officials, Tom. I've talked to the Prime Minister's office about this. Why don't you, let's promote Israel with you. He said, Earl, well, we don't even need to do this right here. <clears throat> Pardon. We don't need to be bragging. I said, look. Look at this propaganda machine from the Islamic side over there. Look what they, they're pumping this trash out, lies, deception every day. And you don't want to tell people about this, Mr. Prime Minister. You don't want to tell people about the ingenuity of the Israeli people and what you're doing to make life so much easier for us. It's not up. That's not like us. We don't believe in doing that. And that's been one of the problems. Israel does not know how to promote herself, and she will not promote herself. That's sad, and, and you know it as well as I do. You it, go there as much as it, I do. Yeah, but it, the problem is, that, you know, this is a wonderful thing. It's a miracle, but that's not the problem. The problem is, like you just talking about Judea and Samaria. You know, I mean, and what's the, what's the name of that place? Azekah. Where they, Azekah. Azekah. I mean, th this is what Western civilization is built on Judeo-Christian principles. Yes, sir. And David and Goliath is a story that every Christian knows. Yes. So when you hear about the argument about the Jews are trying to keep them, you know, Arabs from taking over their legitimate territory. Some like, what are you talking about? Let me tell you something, right. Ben. The fact is, there is a the, the, there is an axiom that we ignore at our peril. No, a, a, any lie becomes the truth if it's allowed to continue. continue. No continue. lie should point. be mm -hmm. permitted to go unanswered, and that's that's why I'm here, frankly. Yeah. I mean, I, I take it upon myself. It's. To, to open my big mouth, because somebody has to do it. And that's why it's important. And again, it's important. It, wait, wait. Is there a website or something I can go to and get this information you're talking about? Just, just, just Google Azekah. Palestinian Media Watch. That's the first oh, one. Oh, Palestinian Israel, Media Israel, Watch. Well, Best one to go to. Israel. Sites Israel. I mean, biblical sites in Judea and Samaria. Yeah. Do you know that the State Department doesn't allow official uh, United States um, uh, uh, expeditions or, you know, tours to go into Judea and Samaria? The United States government, any, any, any uh, delegation that it sponsors is not permitted into Judea and Samaria? And, and that's part of dispelling the importance of Israel to the American people. And that just falls right in line with what the Islamic people are trying, the, the people who follow that are trying to do. Disclaim Israel, don't recognize Israel in any way. We've talked earlier about many things that are happening. We, the United States, you know, our Congress of the United States passed, Tom, Ben, uh, uh, a, a legislation that we should recognize Israel, or Jerusalem, as the capital of Israel. And it's passed across presidents all the way from Clinton back, Carter back, matter of fact, come all the way up. Every six months, that bill comes across the president's desk. Every six months, it's been passed by the United States Congress. And all the president has to do is put his signature on it. It says, we move the embassy of the United States from Tel Aviv back to Jerusalem to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. But not one of them has done it yet. One small correction, Earl. I guess it's... Not Carter. I, I, I guess it's the pedantry of a lawyer. That is law. 
It isn't that the president refuses to sign but it he, into but law. He, he would... It is the law, but the law requires that the Say president that sign a waiver every six months okay, well, if yeah. he doesn't want the the uh, law to take effect. The law to take right. effect. Isn't and so sense? it is the law, but the president waives that every six months. Isn't that sad that they can't even get recognition of their own capital? And it would, you know, a, a nation, a state that's been approved by the United Nations as a legitimate state, they can't even get recognition. Well, you know, I wanted to talk about that actually because, you know, I can understand why the Arabs have their argument and they, they're wanting in there. Okay, I, I can understand that. It's, it's not right. I don't agree with it, but it's somewhat understandable. But I, see, I don't get where the U.S., you know, uh, where the presidents refused to do this or you know um, the Supreme Court recently uh, made a decision um, now on Americans born in Israel um, to on their passport they can't put Jerusalem on there That's so the, the Supreme Court has actually stepped in and, and, and that, flat out denied them to, the right to claim as you said what is legally the, the capital. Court, the Supreme Court didn't say they couldn't do it the Supreme Court ratified the State Department's power to say they Prohibit. can't do it. Now, forgive my pedantry, but there is a it's, difference. It's just another ploy by the administration in Washington, D.C., not to recognize Israel. It's just another one of those things. We've seen it from the very first day that our president entered office. First speech he gave, he went to Cairo, Egypt. Not to one of our friendly countries. He went to Cairo, Egypt. And it's been like this all the way, almost seven years of this now. And the American people are not seeing what's going on. Here, we've got a little country sitting over there in the Middle East. It's our protector against something that's going to come to us from the north, and we're not even recognizing them. We go in and try to get them to give more land. They disengaged from Gaza. I was there when that happened, Tom, Ben, and I saw what happened. They moved all of their people, they, the Israeli people, government, moved all of their people out of a beautiful piece of property that had greenhouses. I mean, it was beautiful there. First thing, that the, uh, that the Arabs did when they went over, the Palestinians did. They tore down all the greenhouses that was, ma that was making money. They took and tore down all the synagogues, and they started digging holes in the ground, making tunnels with money that we had given them, the United States government had given them for humanitarian purposes. They started digging these tunnels all through their land, mm -hmm. digging in, going into Israel. And you know what the, you know, the last war was all about that. And they're still digging, despite whatever happened during the last war. But, you know, if every time you seem to give an inch, they take a mile. You get, gave them Gaza, now they want Judea and Samaria, as we talked about. Why? I mean, when do they stop? They've got Jordan. Jordan, I mean, half of Jordan now is Palestinian, but won't the rest of them move over there? Jordan's got plenty, and Jordan is offering them to come here. They don't want Jordan. They want to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth. They don't want land because if they wanted land, they would have taken back during the Oslo Accords when Arafat was sitting there in Washington, uh, Camp David, and he, we agreed to everything, 97, 90, 98 percent of everything they wanted, and Arafat got up and walked away from it. Can you believe 98 percent of what he was asking for, and he walked away from it? What does that tell you? Do well, they, why settle for 98 percent when you can get 100 percent? Well, that's exactly what he wanted. And if he had gotten 100 percent, he would have had Judea and Samaria. <laughs> so he would have had everything he wanted. But the Israeli people would be left without defensible borders. Does everybody ever think about a defensible border? You start moving them away out of that property out there that they own, that real estate, that means you take away their defensible borders. America, we have defensible borders. You have to have them to defend your country. And you start giving this land away, and all of a sudden, you can't defend your people. And there's Before, really before 1967, which is when the Israelis took back Judea and Samaria, before 1967, the borders of, of Israel, the waste of Israel, the waistline, W-A-I-S-T, was nine miles wide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nine miles. Think about that for a second. Only nine miles. That's only wide, nine, but only nine, nine miles. miles. Yeah. Exactly no trees, right. by the way. No trees. No. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, this whole idea about a two-state solution is nonsense. Forget about it. Annex, Israel must, should annex Judea and Samaria. And if you don't like it, world, tough. Israel should announce that Jerusalem will remain forever the undivided capital of Israel. And if you don't like it, world, tough. And you know something? Talk to me, wait, let me ask you. Well, talk to me about a Palestinian state, because you hear that on the news, and we hear us talk about a Palestinian state. What do they want? What are you talking about? We talk about a Palestinian you know, state. What they want is, to, is they want <laughs> to drive <laughs> the Jews into the sea. The sea. <laughs> and the fact is, I, I guess it was, was it... Uh, 
I don't remember who said it. Maybe it was Golda Meir because she said so many great things. But uh, what, someone said that if Israel uh, lay, if, if the Arabs lay down their weapons, there will be peace tomorrow. <laughs> if Israel lays down its, be no more Israel. its <laughs> weapons tomorrow, there will be no Israel. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And Golda Meir, I know she said this. She said, we'll have peace when the Arabs love oh, their children, children more right. than they hate us. Yeah. So no, there's no there's no compromise. Is it possible that someday will be peace? Maybe. Okay, terrific. When they stop educating their children to hating us and all those games. In the meantime, you know there are some solutions that don't have immediate answers. And the job of the Israeli government is to protect and defend the state of Israel. You know, you talk again about not people not knowing the truth of the matter. You know, when I went to Israel and when I had been there a couple of times, I went down into heart of Jerusalem and that sort of stuff. You know, and, and Jews and Arabs live and work side by side and, and, and the Jews are not killing off Arabs, you know, and Muslims and others. These guys have businesses, they're doing all this kind of stuff and, and nobody pays them any attention. I mean, what, what's up with that? Well, the problem is this. There's a lot of the, uh, the Arabs who work for uh, Jews by day and then uh, exactly. go tuttle it to, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they'll kill by night. Yeah. You can't trust it. Uh, it's, it's a terrible thing. It's the enemy within. But it's not the Jews that are discriminating and laying, you know, pressure on the Arabs just because they're Arabs. Absolutely not. And the interesting thing is Israel is accused of being an apartheid state because yeah. they have this wall. <laughs> The, yeah. the, the wall is not is, is to protect the Israelis. Absolutely. It's not to, it's not to discriminate against the Arabs. You ride down some of the roads over there, you know, it, because the area is right there on the line, on the green. Mm -hmm. And so if you're riding your car down there, if you don't have a wall up there, there's a good chance on the other side, the young kids are going to shoot bullets into that car. Oh, and by the way, times. just as an aside, a wall works. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I hope, Tom, that your audience will recognize, too, that we're talking about all these things happening. But I want to point out once again, it is safe to go to Israel. If they bought tickets to go to Israel, don't cancel them. Don't tear the ticket up. Don't sell it. Go to Israel. It is completely safe. I was over there a couple weeks ago, and we talked to people in the streets. We talked to the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. We talked to people and said, look, tell us, what do you feel? It, you know, I'm from America. I'm here. I feel pretty darn safe. How do you feel? And, you know, they gave me the answers, and I think that those answers you might want to share with the audience. Well, uh, that's great. You uh, actually brought a clip of that, and so yeah. um, I think if it's uh, ready, let's just take a look at this. I'm Earl Cox in Jerusalem, Israel. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Steve Linde. I asked him why, in his opinion, was the president of the Palestinian Authority so reluctant to call on Palestinians to stop their incitement and stop their violence against Israel and the Israeli people. When he talks to his own people on television and on the radio, he does um, appear to encourage the violence, and uh, that is problematic. Um, you have to be consistent, and you have to have intellectual integrity. And so long as uh, he is not actually ready to sit down and negotiate some kind of peace settlement with Israel and with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And the Prime Minister has offered countless times to do that, so long as he's prepared to, not prepared to do that without conditions. I think uh, the problem right now is he doesn't want to jeopardize his own position. Uh, and he's not very popular. And let's face it, he's also perceived as quite corrupt in the Palestinian community. He has a big palace in Ramallah. Um, and people uh, are waiting for a new generation of Palestinian leaders. Um, so I think um, he doesn't want to go where his predecessors have gone before. I don't think he's ready to put his life on the line as, let's say, Anwar Sadat did and uh, come to Jerusalem and meet with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think uh, it's unfortunate that he doesn't see this as his legacy because he's not a young man. Uh, he's past the age of 80, I believe, and uh, if not now, then when? And if he hasn't shown leadership until now to do such a thing and make that, uh, that a significant step forward, I, I, I'm skeptical that he's going to do so in the future. So, yes, he, he is not part of the solution, 
at the moment he's part of the problem. That was Steve Lindy, editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. I'm Earl Cox in Jerusalem, Israel. Before we watch that clip about, um, you know, we talk about what's going on and, and there is uh, threats of violence. There, it, there is some things, if you watch the news, you'll see it, but, you know, it's safe there. And it's amazing that with so much opposition surrounding the country, the uh, security in Israel is Incredible. Top notch, the best in the world, and it really is. You know, it's it, you feel a lot safer than walking down the streets of some American cities. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, as you said, I would encourage people to go there good. because, yeah, it's good to sit here and, and promote Israel from the U.S. And it's good to, uh, you know, say that Christians are standing with the Jewish people and standing with Israel. But, uh, you know, we should go over there, especially as Christians, we should want to um, go over there to support them, one, but go over there to, you know, see purpose, the Bible right? unfold, to see uh, where our faith comes from. Absolutely. I, I'd like to say one thing from the standpoint of a, of a, of a Jew. Uh, three years ago, I took a, a legislator from South Carolina to Israel. Actually, he, I took the first leg and Earl took the second. Uh, and it was an amazing experience for me. And the reason it was an amazing experience for me is because with all of the numerous uh, trips that I've made to Israel since first one being 1965, I was, for the first time, able to see Israel from a completely new vantage point, from the standpoint of this non-Jew, seeing Israel and, 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 and going back and forth and t telling each other about the state of Israel. And all I can say is that it changed his life. It also changed my life. But I will certainly tell you that the first sight that you have of the city of Jerusalem mm -hmm. As you come up that hill yes, and you see that light and you feel that warmth, it will change your life Absolutely. in an instant. The first time you walk into Judea and Samaria Ooh. or you walk over the hill, you look from the Temple Mount, you can see the hill where Abraham carried Isaac to be sacrificed. Mm at what is now the Temple Mount, by the way. Yes, sir. And, and you see the hill and you say, that that's is the, the way of the patriarchs. That's where Abraham first glimpsed this hill. And that will change that's, that's what your you mind. That's preaching now. That's preaching. It will change ahead, your man. soul and your life. I can't begin to describe to you the experience. And the only way you can go is if you trust those who have been there to tell you how incredible it is. <laughs> Are you a judge, Rabbi? Because so. you was <laughs> preaching there, brother. We hope you have enjoyed Rejoice. Garth and Tina want you to be a partner in this ministry. Please send your best love gift today to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. In Canada, please send your best love gift today to TCT, P.O. Box 1220, Fort Erie, Ontario, L2A 5Y2. This has been a TCT production.